Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Now I hope you're all having a great day so far. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Now I wanted to address last week's July 4th shooting that happened just 15 minutes away from where I live. So last Monday was a tragic day for the seven people that lost their lives in Highland Park, Illinois, as well as the over 40 people that were injured in that senseless parade shooting. Yet another senseless gun violent action that took hold of an area very near to where I live. It was a tragic, tragic day. I'm happy that the people I know were not on site in Highland Park, that particular parade, but all of our parades in the surrounding suburbs were then later canceled. Our parades were set up for after 10 o'clock in the morning, and that particular shooting happened right around 10 o'clock in the morning, and so then it was kind of a trickle-down effect that was horrific, horrific, and nobody regardless wanted to participate in any 4th of July activities based on what happened in Highland Park. So we were all not celebrating. We were busy reflecting, expressing our gratitude, trying to scramble to see what we could do to help those people affected in Highland Park, whatever we could do. Um, There was also a lot of blood loss at the local hospital where so many of the injured people were taken to. So they had a blood drive where so many of us had gone to donate blood, something small that we could offer, um, as well as try and take care of some of the small children who were left scrambling about because it was a parade shooting. And so the small children were kind of running about, did not know where their parents or their guardians were. It was a chaotic day to say the very least. So I just wanted to express my reflection on the goings-on of last Monday, July 4th. It was horrible here, an event that I will certainly not forget. So in memory of all of those lives lost for the Highland Park parade shooting last week. So anyway, you guys, let's get on to my show. Welcome. Welcome to episode 11 of my season six. Today is Wednesday, July 13th, 2022. My name is Somal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, all right, you guys, I've got so much to get into today once again. Now, in my compliance tip today, I'm going to get us all back to basics with signature requirements. And yep, it is that second Wednesday of the month, and that means I'm going to be featuring my very newsworthy update on the OYG work plan for June 2022. And I'll be closing out today's episode with some inspirational words on vision and leadership from Mary Ann Williamson. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and my best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve your coding accuracy as you help all of your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer, remember I'm bringing you the news current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, and in billing for multi-specialty physicians, in compliance, and in auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into newsworthy. There are six newsworthy OIG work plan updates for the month of June. Now, the first OIG work plan update for June 2022 is titled Strategies to Improve Access to Maternal Health Care in Medicaid Managed Care. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Evaluation and Inspections. Pregnant people in the United States experience the worst pregnancy outcomes in the developed world 
and significant disparities exist. Maternal health care can then improve pregnant people's pregnancy outcomes. However, many pregnant people in the United States lack access to maternal health care. Medicaid is the nation's largest maternal health care payer, financing more than 42% of all U.S. births, and many pregnant Medicaid beneficiaries are enrolled in managed care plans. This particular study will identify strategies to increase access overall and reduce disparities in access to maternal health care for Medicaid beneficiaries enrolled in managed care. This final report is expected in fiscal year 2023. Now, the second OIG work plan update for June 2022 is titled Indian Health Service Capacity to Manage Supplemental $3.5 billion Allocated to Its Sanitation Facilities Construction Program. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Evaluation and Inspections once again. The Indian Health Service, the IHS, Sanitation Facilities Construction, the SFC, program works in partnership with tribes to prevent the spread of disease by providing American Indians and our Alaska Natives homes and communities with essential water supply, sewage disposal, and solid waste disposal facilities. In fiscal year 2021, IHS identified a need for more than $3.4 billion for SFC projects affecting more than 248,000 new and existing homes. To address that need, Congress appropriated $3.5 billion to the SFC program through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Now, the OIG will assess IHS's capacity to establish agreements and contracts for administering the supplemental $3.5 billion and to oversee the construction of projects paid for using that funding. This final report is also expected in fiscal year 2023. Now, the third OIG work plan update for June 2022 is titled Audit of the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program for fiscal years 2021 and 2022. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Audit Services. The Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, assists low income households in meeting their immediate home energy needs. Now, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program funds can be used to help pay for heating and cooling, crisis assistance, and services such as counseling to reduce the need for energy assistance. Now, at the federal level, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program is administered by the Administration for Children and Families, the ACF. Now, states either administer the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program or they'll award them funds to subgrantees that administer the program on a state's behalf. Federal requirements allow for 10% of total grant funds to be used for planning and administering the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Now, previous OIG and Government Accountability Office audits revealed that the ACF oversight of this program was not adequate to ensure that states and subgrantees consistently administered grant funds in accordance with federal requirements. Now, since March of 2020, the federal government has appropriated $9.3 billion for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program through the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Securities Act, the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan Act, as well as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the annual Low Income Home Energy Assistant Programs Block Grant. Now, the OIG plans to conduct a series of audits of this program at high-risk states to determine whether the selected states at high risk had monitored subgrantees to ensure compliance with the federal and state low income home energy assistant programs requirements. Now, this final report is expected in fiscal year 2023. Now, the fourth OIG work plan update for June 2022 is titled States and MCOs Compliance with Mental Health Parity Requirements. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Audit Services. The Paul Wellstone and Pete Dominici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008 
promotes equal access to treatment for mental health and substance use disorder by prohibiting coverage limitations that apply more restrictively to mental health and substance use disorder benefits than medical or surgical benefits. Such limitations could include higher co-payments, separate deductibles, and stricter pre-authorization or medical necessity reviews as compared to other covered medical treatments. Federal regulations require managed care organizations or MCOs with plans that provide services to our Medicaid enrollees to comply with the parity provisions of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Now, federal regulations require that states or their MCOs, as applicable, conduct analyses to demonstrate compliance with parity requirements. CMS reviews states' parity analyses as part of its review of states' MCO contracts. The OIG will audit CMS's oversight of states' compliance with federal parity requirements, including whether states and their MCOs conducted the required parity analyses and whether states ensured that their MCOs complied with certain parity requirements for the mental health and substance use disorder benefits. This final report is expected again in fiscal year 2023. Now, the fifth OIG work plan update for June 2022 is titled Medicare Administrative Contractor Cost Report Settlements with Audit. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Audit Services. Now, HHS contracts with our Medicare Administrative Contractors, the MAX, to process claims and cost reports and determine payment amounts to providers. And this is found in the Social Security Act, Section 1874. A. Max determine the total amount of reimbursement based on providers' cost reports. Max perform a desk review and, at their discretion, may perform either a field audit or an in house audit to determine the cost report's adequacy, completeness, and accuracy. Generally, some cost reports that have been audited and settled are later reopened to correct audit adjustments. CMS has stated that it does not maintain data related to the number of cost reports that are reopened, the monetary adjustments to the settlement made as a result of reopenings, or the types and or causes of adjustments. So OIG's objective will be threefold. First, to quantify the extent to which the MAC amends audit adjustments after cost reports have been audited and settled, and whether those audit adjustments contain obvious errors or are inconsistent with the law, regulations, and rulings, or other general instructions. Second, to quantify the effect of amended audit adjustments. And finally, third, gain an understanding of the types and or causes of amended audit adjustments. Initially, OIG will audit a single MAC, and based on those results, they may expand this work to other MACs as well. This final report is expected in fiscal year 2023. And the sixth and final OIG work plan update for June 2022 is titled Food and Drug Administration's Actions Regarding the Abbott Infant Formula Recall. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Audit Services. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act requires the Food and Drug Administration, that's our FDA, to safeguard the nation's food supply, including infant formula, and ensure that all ingredients are safe. As part of its oversight activities, FDA conducts inspections at infant formula manufacturers and can require infant formula manufacturers to recall adulterated infant formula that presents a risk to human health. Now, the OIG will determine whether the FDA followed the inspections and recall process for infant formula in accordance with federal requirements. Specifically, the OIG will review the FDA's actions leading up to the infant formula recall at the Abbott facility in February of 2022 to determine whether the FDA followed all applicable policies and procedures for these two things. Did they conduct inspections of the manufacturing facility? And finally, second, did they oversee, did they oversee Abbott's initiation of the infant formula recall? Now, this final report is again expected in fiscal year 2023. All right. 
So six OIG work plan updates for the month of June 2022. Now, I'm interested definitely in finding out more about the results of the Medicare Administrative Contractor Cost Report settlements with audit. I hope the OIG can pinpoint why the data has not been maintained nor retained in relation to the number of cost reports that are reopened, the monetary adjustments to the settlement made as a result of reopenings, nor the types and or causes of those adjustments. And of course, the U.S. has topped the list year after year for worst pregnancy outcomes in the developed world, and significant disparities exist as well year after year in the nation. So, of course, I'm very interested to see what strategies are finally being developed and then eventually deployed to increase access to quality care for our Medicaid population. So, in my opinion, I always pass this detailed information on to my providers who need it to review their coding and their billing practices as applicable or their overarching compliance programs. I think these reports with findings are always most interesting and informative, and I always look forward to analyzing them in the years ahead. It's also important for my listeners to pay attention to these monthly OIG work plan updates to see how they may impact you your provider, or your health system. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. So in today's new back to basics compliance tip, I wanted to focus on a recurring issue I see in documentation time and time again, the provider signature. Is it written? Is it electronic? Is it stamped? Can I just close the EMR? close the note without a signature. Well, I've seen all of this from all the no-nos to great compliant signatures. So as I've said on my podcast and other collaborative efforts I've made with others on their podcasts or in the webinars I present or in the articles I write, I believe CMS and Medicare has a lot of good and useful information for all of us in the business side of healthcare. Now, Palmetto GBA is a Medicare administrative contractor, a MAC, in the states of North and South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, as well as in the jurisdiction containing the states of Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. So, in my opinion, Palmetto GBA has a really good, insightful letter that's been developed and retained on their website, and it's from the desks of the Palmetto GBA medical directors. This is a really good letter that I want to showcase here. Now, in it, it states, quote, Palmetto GBA frequently encounters errors assessed by the comprehensive error rate testing the CERT review contractor due to signature problems on submitted medical records, on x-ray reports, and on laboratory or on radiology orders. As Medicare providers, you may be asking what significance this has for you. The discovery of the CERT errors may lead to increased scrutiny of future services that you bill to Medicare. Your understanding of this important issue is essential to ensuring the accuracy of your Medicare claims. Palmetto GBA strives to communicate with the Medicare physician community, compliance officers, provider outreach and education advisory groups, contractor advisory committee members, hospital administrators, and others. We feel it is critical to share this information with you. We believe that a reduction in signature errors problems can be accomplished through timely and thorough provider education. We want you to know what is needed to resolve these issues. By fully understanding documentation requirements, you can improve your accuracy with claim submissions. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, requires that services provided or ordered be authenticated by the author. Palmetto GBA has examined numerous examples of CERT signature denials and found in almost every instance the basic documentation was acceptable. However, these services were denied due to one of the following unacceptable signature reasons. Number one, illegible, unrecognizable handwritten signatures or initials. 
Number two, transcribed or typed progress notes with a typed name only and no written or electronically validated signature. Number three, unverified or unauthorized electronic signatures. And finally, fourth, lack of any indication of the rendering physician or rendering practitioner. Palmetto GBA values your time and respects the many challenges physicians and healthcare providers face as they provide needed medical services to our aged and disabled population. However, the obligation to submit medical record documentation with valid signatures cannot be avoided. Valid signatures allow for verification that provided services have been accurately and fully documented, reviewed, and authenticated. A valid signature also confirms that the provider is certifying the provided item or service was medically reasonable and medically necessary, which in turn allows consideration for timely and appropriate payments. Important elements to remember are, number one, if a signature has legibility issues, a signature log or an attestation statement needs to accompany the claim. Number two, electronically signed records must have digitized signatures, which means an electronic image of an individual's handwritten signature reproduced in its identical form using a pen from a tablet or electronic signatures with date and timestamps that include such verbiage as, quote, electronically signed by, verified by, reviewed by, or authenticated by, end quote. We strongly recommend professional designation or credentials as coverage for many services is provider specialty dependent. Without credentials, payment may be unnecessarily delayed and or coverage may be denied. Operational processes and or work with your technical staff or software vendors may be needed to further ensure valid signatures per CMS instructions are affixed to every order, every record, or every report within a reasonable time frame. Now, this would customarily be expected within 48 to 72 hours after the encounter and certainly before the claim is submitted to Medicare for payment consideration. Third, digital signatures are typically generated by special encrypted software that allows for sole usage. Fourth, signature stamps are not allowable as valid authentication for Medicare purposes. An exception would apply for a physically disabled author or provider who can provide proof of their inability to sign due to their disability. Fifth, Reports or records that are dictated and or transcribed without valid signatures are not acceptable for reimbursement. A typed name is simply not a valid signature. Sixth, auto-authentication or auto-signature systems that do not mandate or permit the new provider to review an entry before signing are strongly discouraged. Any indication that a document has been signed but not read is simply not acceptable. Seventh, safeguards must be in place to protect against unauthorized access and inappropriate use of your electronic signature by anyone other than the designated individual to whom it is assigned. It is to be unique to him or to her and not reassigned or reused by someone else. Furthermore, measures should be in place to protect the links between electronic health information and signatures to ensure there is no possibility of unapproved alteration. And finally, eighth, I love that the medical directors at Palmetto GBA end with a paragraph that states, we encourage you to share this information in support of our efforts to ensure that claims and supporting documentation are properly indicated on claim submissions or on redetermination requests. And they also tell us all to look further into this expansive list of acceptable and unacceptable examples of signatures in the Palmetto GBA article, quote, Medicare medical records, signature requirements, acceptable and unacceptable practices. So I thought this was a incredible find from the medical directors at Palmetto GBA. I really like this letter. I support 
all of the items that they disclosed as important elements to remember. I know I've said this on many presentations because Medicare does not give a time period for when that signature needs to be made, right? Within a day of seeing the patient, within two days, within a month, how many days can go by before you finalize and sign that note. So my best practice recommendation has always been, I've always told my providers within 72 hours, you should be signing and dating your note. Even further, from a compliance standpoint, it's wonderful for practices to put that in writing, that they have created their own internal policy documenting the fact that they are going to be closing the note within 72 hours. And here in this instance, Palmetto GBA says between 48 and 72 hours, right? Because the language in the CMS processing manual is very vague and simply says within a general reasonable time frame, right? And that's simply not specific enough. So I really appreciate the fact that Palmetto GBA puts it in writing here for their, their providers in both of their jurisdictions that it should be customarily expected within 48 to 72 hours after the encounter. And I also furthermore love the fact that they don't want other people to be signing that EMR electronically, right? It should only be Dr. Patel, for example. It should only be in the name of Dr. Patel who is reading the medical record that he just documented, right? He just wrote down that entire soap note. He's reviewing it and he's finally signing it within 48 to 72 hours within the Palmetto GBA jurisdiction. So he's complying to the policy set forth by Palmetto GBA. They put that up on their public website, as well as Dr. Patel and his office has a compliance program, that, as well as the credentials of the providers. I know I've said that to my providers many a time. It's important that you have that comma RN, that comma NP, that comma MD, or that comma DO, so the Medicare contractor knows who you are, what your specialty is, who you are as a provider type. I think that's incredibly important not to just simply ignore that most important credential that you do hold. So I love that Palmetto GBA identifies so many things that I agree with as well in terms of what signature requirements are a must for submitting valid claims to Medicare. So I really do believe it's fundamental if you have Medicare as a payer to keep your eye on correct and compliant coding and billing and documentation practices and make sure that you are adhering to all of them to make sure that you're meeting the medical necessity from the very start. Because when the documentation paints the medical picture with clarity and vibrancy from the onset of care, a certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, I focus season six's spark on vision and leadership. I want this six season spark to be filled with the world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for vision and leadership in all we strive to do. So in this week's inspiring quote, in spark is from author and activist, Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Absolutely true, right? I think this quote inspires us. It reminds us that we all have fears. It's important to recognize each and every visionary and leader has fears. This quote reminds us that we all have greatness within us. This quote inspires us to allow that greatness and power to come to the surface. This quote inspires us to let our power and greatness soar. We are all capable of letting go of that fear to become our very best selves. I am happy Marianne Williamson spark still burns brightly in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. 
Please have an amazing week ahead and please continue staying safe and healthy. That wily COVID-19 is still lurking amongst us. So do remember to sign up online at usps.com and get your free COVID-19 tests and restock on masks as you need as well over the summer. The numbers are going up a bit in pockets throughout the country. Thank you so much for listening in on today's episode, and I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.